Next week, Bezad Hashem, is Pesach. So I'm hoping you are ready in the midst of the action. So if not, that's not good. That a week and a half from now is Pesach and you're still not ready. But nevertheless, I'm going to talk a little, bit, a little bit about today how to kasher and what needs to be kashered for Pesach and what can you do, what you cannot do. I mean, there's a lot what to know. We're just going to generally talk about everything. We last uh, class started uh, learning how you need to have all your, your, your cutlery, plates, cups, pots, pans, everything has to be kosher for Pesach. The easiest way out, and that's not only the easiest, but the best way possible, is to just have everything set just for Pesach, and not to start kashering everything. A, because it's a big headache, but more than that, if you make a mistake, then uh, why take a chance? When it comes to Pesach, you have to make sure that there's no chances here. This is uh, the prohibitions. We learned that last class, class, the prohibitions in Torah about Pesach. These are severe prohibitions. This is not like a recommendation. So all these surim, all the prohibitions of Pesach are isurei karet, which are the severest punishment one can experience. And you don't want to take a chance with that. So that's why on Pesach everybody goes goes crazy, goes fanatic. The best and most safest is to have everything set just for Pesach. So you have pots for Pesach, pans for Pesach, plates for Pesach, and so forth. And of course, a lot of people, they use uh, the, uh, disposable plates and, uh, and cups and uh, forks and knives, which that is, works well, but you still need pots and pans. And of course, you have uh, many other things in the kitchen. But like I said, uh, we learned that in the previous class, better to have a whole set. If you can, I mean, we have a, everything is, we replace for Pesach, even our oven. I mean, we have a, a Pesach oven. We just take the oven, the regular oven out, put it in the room where we sell the chametz, and we bring the, uh, the Pesach oven, and this is an oven that never saw chametz in its life. For many years, I used to kasher the oven. Forget about the three-hour yeah. process and the headache. How do you know if you really got it right? How do you know? I was so OCD when it came to, to kasher the oven. I would kasher the oven for two hours and maybe I missed a point. Maybe I missed a spot. Okay, I have to do it again. I would do it again. And, and then uh, one can really go OCD on that because what if I missed a spot? Maybe a little point in the corner there and then, oh my gosh, what, I'm going to be eating comments now? Okay, let's do it again. So uh, if you can afford... It's not so expensive. I mean, you don't need the top-of-the-line Rolls Royce of ovens for Pesach. You can buy now here in the corner here in the store. Last year, we bought another oven for Pesach. I think it was like 1,100 shekels, which is, you know, it's not, uh, I mean, uh, definitely not expensive. But if you can, uh, it's definitely worth investing. Of course, you need a place where to store it. But all the stuff that we have for Pesach never saw chametz in its life. I mean, the oven that we use... There was never chametz in it, so I don't even have the, the chashash, the scare, that maybe it has the taste of chametz in it. But if that is not possible, then needless to say, there's many things that we have to kasher. I mean, one of them is the oven, which is not an easy process. And then, of course, our sink, because our sink also gets uh, not, uh, not kosher. And the stovetop, and sometimes you don't have, uh, this is another thing we have, we have a stovetop just for Pesach. Why, why again go into to the whole headache? And then an oven and cabinets and a freezer and there's so many different things that you can't uh, I mean, get, get a whole house just for Pesach. That's why a lot of people just prepare, prefer just selling the whole house and they move out. So yeah, that's sometimes the easiest. You just sell the whole house and you go camp by somebody else. Uh, but again, not always it's... Uh, so easy to do when you start having a lot of kids yeah. and you don't know where to go, then uh, it's not so easy. Yeah. A few years ago, my wife was exactly due after Pesach and uh, she was like, I can't make Pesach, it's mm. too much. Yeah. And, uh, and I was like, okay, well, what are our options? I mean, we don't have much options. So she was like, let's go to one of these Pesach resorts. 
And I was like, yeah, then that's, you need a mortgage for that, the, the, to go to one of these resorts. And she was like, I'll find us a deal. <laughs> okay, good luck. And then uh, she, she had a very original idea. She started calling all these resorts and told them, uh, my husband is a world-renowned speaker. He will speak for you and just take us. So she found the resort that says, okay. So for a week, I had to speak. Morning, night, and day, all the time. I had to give classes. <laughs> my, it was on you. Yeah. My wife was in the pool with the kids, and I had to give classes in the morning, classes in the afternoon, lectures at night. I was like the, uh, you know, she put me to work. So she told me, well, I got a great deal. It's only going to cost us whatever it was. But they had to, we had to pay like a very small amount, which was nothing compared to what would cost us to buy matzot and wine and cleaning and all that. Yeah. And I was like, okay, what's the catch? She was like, well, you, uh, you uh, just have to give a few lectures. I was like, really? A few? How much? Uh, few? Few every part of the day? So... <laughs> But Baruch Hashem, as long as my kids and my wife had fun, that's what's, what, that was the most important part. And the following year, they were so happy with the service, so we got another round. So, but it's nice to go to these resorts, but it's not really Pesach. Yeah. It's like a vacation. Yeah. It's a nice vacation, but uh, both my wife and me agreed that when we came back, you don't feel Pesach. It's not the real deal. So nevertheless, so... When it comes to my utensils, forks, knives, plates, cups, I really do recommend to get a set for Pesach and at least uh, plates and cups and things that are easy to get disposables, although I don't promote this whole disposable thing. Uh, but try to ev avoid the, the cash ring. You know, to buy a peeler for two shekels, better just buy a peeler just for Pesach and just to have it separated. But then comes things that are a little bit harder, and uh, uh, one of them is our sink, because our sink does get unkosher from uh, chametz. Now, not all the sinks you can kosher. If you have a, a sink that is made out of uh, porcelain or out of uh, clay, like cheres, cheres is clay, it's like more like uh, ceramic, then you can kosher it. It's not gonna, nothing's going to do, it's going to help. Plastic? I mean, most sinks are not from plastic. In the home? Uh, no, plastic. The new one. Uh, well, most of the new ones are either, uh, uh, there's a type of a metal, it's called nirosta, and that can be kashered. The only problem is that uh, in one of the houses that once we rented, the sinks were from this uh, fine metal, it's called nirosta. And I came with a blowtorch and I started kashering it, and I, and I it didn't melt, but it made a lot of stains because of the heat. It's a b boiling hot uh, fire and everywhere I went with the fire to to blowtorch it started making these blue stains. I was like, oh great, now I'm gonna have to get a new, gotta get a new uh, sink. So the best is just to clean the sink very very well and then you put another sink in it and this is, these are the things that you buy for, for a very small amount you buy them from uh, either from uh, from plastic or from uh, metal. There's some of them that you, they actually buy from. Uh, it's not metal, rather it's uh, or the material. No, the material they use for cars. It's called uh, uh, not aluminum, but nevertheless, it's type of a metal. It's uh, uh, in Hebrew, it's called pach. It's not really a strong metal, but nevertheless, you clean the sink very very well. Best to clean it with boiling hot water, and you clean it with some. Uh, chemical that will, you know that it will kill anything. Uh, really also highly recommend is to buy a clog removal chemical and to spread it around the drain and, and in the drain because it will literally kill any living <laughs> organism. And the point is that you want to melt the chametz because chametz that is not edible then is not considered chametz. Mm. So one of the ways of doing it is you, there are strong chemicals, usually I don't like using chemicals on anything. But here you want to buy a good strong chemical, not bleach, but there's some chemicals that are cleaning to clean uh, sinks and toilets. And you spread it all around the sink and it will make anything that is chametz unedible. Oh. And by that part, you, the chametz is not chametz anymore. Is baking soda and vinegar going to do the job? 
uh, unless you clean very, very well. But when it comes to the sink, if you're looking at the drain of the sink, yeah. there's usually there's very hard to really get everywhere. And then you might have chametz underneath the drain. For the whole area with the drain, better to spill some strong chemical. What it will do, it will make anything there not edible. And then that way you're safe with chametz because even if it's in the drain, just imagine how much chametz is going into your drain and it gets stuck on the pipes inside. You don't have any possession of chametz. So the, the best is to, to really get this clog cleaning chemical. You pour it into the drain, it stinks. It's very, very harsh chemical, but it will kill everything. Killing, I mean, it's going to burn all the, anything that is edible. That way you know that there's no chametz in there. And needless to say, you want to make sure that it's clean. So if you can clean it with vinegar or, or baking soda, great. But there are always the cracks in between where it's going to be extremely, extremely hard to. Another way of doing it is if you have the ability, is you fill in the sink. If it's a sink that is made out of metal, a lot of the sinks are metal and you will fill it with uh, uh, boiling hot water. Uh, you can get, we used to have it for camping, and uh, it's like a, in Hebrew it's called a heating fork, because it looks like a fork, and you would put it in water and it will boil water. Use it for camping sometimes. So what you can do is fill up the sink with water, with hot water to start with, then you'll put that uh, uh, heating thing in, and it's safe and we'll start boiling the water and then what do you all, all you need to do is the, once the water reached a boiling point is you need to put in like maybe a, I used to put a big stone and then the stone makes the water overflow over the sink you get a little bit of water on the floor but it cushions the sink but nevertheless it depends on the material of the sink usually uh, uh, the men are more in charge of the kitchen but if it uh, depends on the husband, some husbands are not so, uh, uh, you know, work savvy in the kitchen area. But nevertheless, you want to make sure that the, the, the sink is, is kosher. Now, like I said, it's also very good that you clean the, the, the drain with a strong chemical. And then, of course, you have the, all the faucets because the sink is a very uh, troubled place for Chametz, you make dishes and it spritzes everywhere. So you want to also make sure that also the faucet and the taps and everything are also clean from chametz. The best way of doing it is just to, to boil the kettle and to pour, pour boiling hot water on the faucet and on the taps that anything that is left there that it dried out will uh, start melting from the boiling hot water. So you, you're making a little bit of a mess but the point is that you want to make sure that the, around the taps and the faucet there's no chametz stuck there. Now, if you can, it depending again on the material, if you can blowtorch it, then better. But again, I had the same thing once that I blowtorched the sink, the faucet, and it, <laughs> it ruined its color. So that, that's not always good, especially when you rent something and they, uh, then, uh, then you have to pay for that. Now, needless to say, that uh, when you have like a, uh, here in Israel it's pretty common that you put uh, like a little drain, like a net in the drain and it catches all the junk. Needless to say that that, if it's going to be removed and needless to say you remove it for Pesach and you get a, uh, another one for Pesach and some of them are screwed into the, to the sink, better to take it off, clean it very well and cover it. But after you clean everything you definitely want to put in a uh, temporary sink that all your, your, your utensils for Pesach will go in that sink and they're not going to touch the other sink. Now comes a little bit of a harder uh, thing to clean which is the stovetop. Now here in Israel it's also pretty popular that the stovetop is glass, it's ceramic glass, that you can't kosher. Doesn't matter what you're going to do, you're not going to be able to kosher it, so you have to cover it very well, clean it very well, cover it very well, and use something else. And uh, the problem is that a lot of these portable burners, they're not so strong, you can't really cook with them. It's good for making boiling an egg, but to really cook with them, that's not so uh, useful. But there are some stove tops that are very, uh, very powerful, and you can definitely cook with them. 
Now, if for whatever reason you do have a stove top that is metal and you want to cushion it, A, you want to know what you're doing. I mean, we're going to learn how to do it, just that you have the knowledge, but this is a, you have to know what you're doing because chas v'shalom, it can be dangerous. But uh, the, assuming that the stove top is metal, then one way of doing it is if you have a self-cleaning oven, as you take everything apart and you put it in the self-cleaning oven and you let it clean. And that will kosher it. I'm talking about the, the, the rings that you put on the, where the flame is and the base of it. It's all pieces that you can take out. Needless to say, it has to be cleaned completely. Completely, completely clean. Yeah. Tell me the stove top. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Electric, that's what I said. Electric, you can't kosher it. Any? Yeah. Not any, depending on the, on the type. But the ones that are, have ceramic top and glass top, that you can kosher. And the electric, it depends. Some of them has the exposed coil. Then it's also, uh, 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 the, you have to really look at the type of the oven, of the stove top. What I used to do, when I used to cushion my uh, stove top, I would cover everything with foil. I would make like a, like a tent of foil. Then poke a little bit of holes in it, so air can come out. Then I would open the gas completely, without fire. Just let the gas run out. But since it was like, a bubble of foil, then the gas would stay inside. Then I would zip poke these holes, and then take one match and throw the match inside. Oh. It will make such a, not an explosion, but such a burn. But fire didn't come out because I had this foil bubbled around it. But the heat it would create by uh, burning it, then that's it. The whole thing would get kashered within a couple of seconds because it didn't have a place for the air to go out. So it made a very high, high uh, temperature heat. That's how it would kasher the whole stove top and uh, it would good, be, be good to go. Then I would just to add on that, would take a blowtorch and blowtorch all the, the, the base of, the, of the, what you put the pots on. But like I said, you need to know what you're doing. You can't just uh, start playing with the fire and then blow the whole, the whole house. <laughs> the whole, blow the whole house up. That wouldn't be so, uh, so uh, productive. So, uh, even if you turn the, you know, even if you turn it all the way up high, it's not going to kosher the oven, the stove stop. If you want to do that, then uh, it's, you have to cover everything with a foil that the heat will stay. Because if you just turn on the stove top, the, uh, the heat is not strong enough to, and it's not direct on the metal to kosher the metal. When I used to do these uh, little nuclear explosions in the, in the explosions in the kitchen, don't then, do it at home. yeah, don't do it at home. <laughs> but, uh, but I would, uh, once I had everything after the explosion, <laughs> then I had the whole burners working for a good 20 minutes, half an hour, but it was all covered with uh, foil. So there wasn't any exposed fire. And I just poked holes in the foil so there's going to be air. Without air, there wouldn't be any fire. But anyways, like uh, you said, don't try it at home. Better to bring somebody that knows yeah. what they're doing. And uh, the problem is that uh, if you wait for the last three days, you'll never find anybody to come and cash her. If you do it now, you have a much better chance to find somebody. I'm sure there are people that they offer their services to come and cash your oven and cash your stove top. Or the easy way out is you just cover everything, clean everything very well. You cover it, seal it completely with foil, and then you just get yourself a 130 shekel burner. I mean, there's real good ones. Uh, last year we bought a bunch of them. I think they cost about 400 shekels, and they're like industrial burners. They're strong, they're very powerful burners. And uh, this is good enough. I mean, they only have two burners, so you might need to buy two of them. But uh, nevertheless, it's powerful. You can actually make uh, re real cooking on it. Hot plate, can you cover it with a double oil after you uh, If you have hot plates, the plateaus, okay. again, since they're very cost uh, effective and they're not expensive, better to use a whole brand new one for Pesach. Because they're not expensive. But if budget is an issue, then you, you, two covers will not be enough. You still have to cushion it. Yeah, uh, yeah. You have to. Yeah, you have to take a blowtorch and you have to the, the, literally go with the blowtorch on every uh, part of the surface. 
to go slowly, that the hot fire will be at least two, three seconds on every part of the cover, of the surface, and you have to literally go like uh, one part after the other, you have to cushion the whole uh, t top. After you cushion it, you have to cover it with the, with the foil. But that's why sometimes it's easier just to, again, it depends on budget. If a person has the ability, better just to buy everything for Pesach. We have everything for Pesach, plateau, stove tops, all these stuff. I want to deal with it every year. Not the time and not the headache and not the scare that maybe I missed uh, a part. Now, since the hot plates, the hot plates, you know, they get dirty throughout the, the year. You put the uh, challah on them to warm it up on Shabbat, and you put food on it, and the food is full of chametz. Whether, you know, here, for example, every, almost every second day, they're warming the burekasim on the hot plates. I mean, this is like straight chametz on the hot plate. Even though we always cover it with the foil, just for the cleansiness, but still, this is something that you really have to cash Now, if you don't have a, a, bur a burner, and, uh, and you don't know how to do it, why would you even want to take a chance that your uh, hot plate has chametz on it? So, and, and again, the severity of chametz is the, one of the worst severities in the Torah. It's called the Isur Karet. That the chas v'shalom a person uh, fails, the punishment is karet. Why would you want to even play with it when it comes to Pesach? So the hot plate's a little bit of a problematic one because the, the, the chametz touches it directly. Anything that you cook, I mean, some people in the press are cleaning, they, they clean their bathroom. Okay, you want a clean bathroom, but I don't know much people that eat in the bathroom. I mean, some people maybe do eating, you know how to eat in the bathroom. You put food in the bathroom, will make the food have uh, impurity on it. Now I'm telling you off the subject, you can't go in with food into the bathroom, even when you're chewing gum. I'm not uh, recommending to chew gum for both Derech Eretz and health, but nevertheless, if you, even if you come in with, to the bathroom with gum, you're not allowed to eat in the bathroom. But you know, you have little kids and they run around and uh, uh, chametz can come to the bathroom, fine, clean the bathroom. But uh, some people, you know, when they comes to the, so the Pesach cleaning, I see them like hanging on the ceilings on the chandelier, you know, there's no chametz on the chandelier, I can guarantee to you. So i never seen anybody sitting with a roll and like throw, throwing the chametz over there. But nevertheless, so the kitchen is the one where you want to really make sure everything is kosher. In the, in the laundry room and in the bathroom and uh, in places like that, there's not going to be, not, what's the chances for be chametz there? Also in your bedroom, in the compartments in the closet that are, you know, where you put the winter stuff, there's not going to be chametz there. So it's good to do cleaning. But uh, you don't have to go cuckoo here. When it comes to the kitchen, that's where you need to put all your effort. And anything that touched chametz throughout the year, the highest and best way is just to get a uh, replacement. If you can't, because it's expensive, so you, I always recommend. So once in your life, you invest. You invest for Pesach. So and you just need a place to store everything. And you, you go, okay, a little bit out. So, for example, even those hot water urns that we use, the, the hot water, they also have to be kosher for Pesach. Especially the ones over here. Yeah. I mean, we have cookies here all the time. I don't know what people do with them. Yeah. I just see there's cookies here. I don't know. Uh, sometimes I see people, because they come, they make coffee, they come with a plate with a cookie on it, and they put it on the hot water urn. I mean, it's way too close to chametz. Yeah. So, and again... They're not so expensive. I think, what do they cost? 150 shekels. So, so again, I know it sounds uh, like everything is, this is 150, this is, uh, at the end, everything is a lot of money. But if you can afford it better, that's what I always had. I always invested in, in, in for the Pesach stuff. And once a year, you take it out of the storage, you acquire it, uh, what do we say in Hebrew? Hoshaket, peace of mind. But, like I said, the sink is a little bit hard to pull out, and the oven is not so easy. The oven is a little bit harder to get a, 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 kasher, a, a, a Pesach oven. But you do whatever you can. But needless to say, you want to make sure that, that if you're already cleaning it, it has to be extremely, extremely clean. For example, like what I said with the, with the oven, oven is a very hard uh, thing to, to kasher. You really got to sit there with a the blowtorch for two hours. And I told you, I would be so OCD. Oh my gosh, maybe I've missed an inch 
uh, a millimeter. So one, one option is if you have an oven that is a self-cleaning oven. But that's uh, not so common here in Israel. They're very expensive in Israel to buy the self-cleaning ovens. And there's two problems. First of all, it has to be minimum 900 degrees. So 900 degrees Celsius, not Fahrenheit. So even the, a lot of the, mar the ovens that are on the market, they're not going to produce 900 degrees. So that's first of all. Second of all, uh, another problem is, is, the, is, the, is the glass. And the glass, there's a little bit of a problem with kashrut. When it comes to the self-cleaning oven, the glass might not get kashered. The window, there's a window of the door. And then only that, also in the place where it's connected to the glass, to the door. But uh, even let's say you do have one of them, then better to, 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 to use it. But also it's, uh, even the self-cleaning oven is good to go with the blowtorch. Now, <clears throat> there's another thing that is a little bit harder to replace, which is your fridge. And the fridge is full of uh, chametz. And that you have to be uh, either very wealthy or have a very huge home to have a place where to store a fridge. So the fridge you really have to clean. And you have to make sure that you're taking all the uh, uh, shelves out and cleaning every little thing. The fridge is usually the hard one, especially when you have the rubber around the door. If you bend the rubber a little bit, you'll see how much chametz is in there. So the fridge is really uh, a big project. And after you clean the fridge, you still have to cover all the shelves and everything with foil or with some plastic or something that will, will uh, uh, prevent any, any t direct touching with where chametz touched. So some people just buy ready things. They have these ready plastic trays. But uh, nevertheless, the cleaning of the fridge has to be very, very thorough because, you know, even though the fridge gets cleaned on a weekly base, daily base, it's still there's certain places in there that you, you can't even believe how chametz went in there. You want to take as much as you can apart, all the shelves, all the compartments. Toothbrush and, works very well. Yeah, toothpicks, toothbrush. And, uh, and did you know what you clean your <laughs> ears with? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. How do you call it? Uh, Q-tips. Yeah. Q-tips. Yeah. But uh, or or you just burn the whole fridge down and. That's yeah. another. Is there an Indian of like you keep, you keep mentioning like if there's one speck there left, you know, like how do we not become OCD crazy over face that? Zero. The mind and that would be like, oh my gosh, what if I didn't clean it all the way? So I would, I would say that you would only want to go OCD on a few things. Mm -hmm and where you know there are for sure uh, chametz there. Mm -hmm. So an OCD, but not in a, no, not in a crazy way. On the fridge, you want to go a little bit uh, OCD here. But the point is that you do your best. You really go out of your way to clean every little thing with the Q-tips and the toothpicks and the toothbrushes and everything. Mm -hmm. And as long as it's the majority is, you see to the eyes very, very clean, that's it, you can leave it alone. Isn't there like an Indian also like of the Bidika Hamas? You say you say a prayer that would say like whatever that Maxish I didn't yeah. clean right. all the way, that like exactly. it's also gone. Yeah, right. that's why I said you don't have to go so cuckoo here about the cleaning. You have to clean the surface well. Yeah. And and today anyways most of the cleaning is done with chemicals. Once you spritz chemicals everywhere, it's not Hamas anymore. Mm -hmm. So even in the fridge, even you go all these cracks and everything, all you need to do is take a strong chemical that usually during the year you would not use but you just spritz it everywhere and you wipe it, that's it. The chemical will make anything that it will touch not edible. And if you take now a piece of bread and you spray it with chemicals and it's not edible, not for you, not for an animal, it's not chametz anymore. So uh, you want to clean thoroughly. And once you reach to the level that it's thoroughly clean, then that's where your OCD stops. And when you're doing the biur chametz and the exactly the part when you're saying, whatever I missed, should turn into ashes, and then main, re, mainly the cleaning, that's what we talked about last week, is that the main cleaning here is cleaning m my inside, my, my chametz, my ego. The outside cleaning is just to represent the, that I put effort here, 
And not only that, yes, there is a mystical reason that my house has to be completely clean. Because when I want to heal myself, I have to clean myself first. If you go now to a, a, a natural healer, and they will first tell you, first detox. Before I can t do anything, first detox, detoxify your body. Same thing here. I want to change. Pesach is a time of change. It's not the time of suffering. It's the time where I really look inside myself and I want to look for all the points that I want to get rid of. My ego, my, my, my weaknesses, my, my anger, my frustration, all these emotions and midot that I want to get rid of. And in order to get rid of it, first it has to be, everything has to be cleaned. You go now to a doctor, whatever they do, first they sterilize the place. They can't start doing anything before they sterilize it. First they clean it, then you start operating. Same thing here. So your house is your domain. I mean, your house is so where, where your, your mahout, your essence is. Sometimes you walk into somebody's house, you feel their energy. That's where you are. So you need your house to be clean. I'm not talking right now on the literal level that you can own, see, or eat chametz. You can't just have, walk into a house and have bread everywhere. So the cleaning has to be thorough cleaning. Technically, two or three days you can get the whole house ready for Pesach. People go six weeks before that and literally they shave walls. I don't even know what people do. <laughs> people go completely Google. Okay, so call it spring, spring cleaning. I understand once a year you want to move the fridge out of its place and you want to clean the chandeliers and those top shelves. Fine. But don't call it pasta cleaning and definitely don't be OCD here for the, for the chametz. Clean well. And you know what? You can do that every, every couple of months. You don't have to wait for Pesach. <laughs> but the places where you are going to have chametz, the kitchen, that's where you want to be not OCD, but be very thorough. And make sure that you're cleaning it very well to a point that anything that is visible with your eye is gone. So in the oven, what I used to do, I used to go with the blowtorch because sometimes you see the chametz with your own eye. And how do you know that you're burning it? That it suddenly starts burning. The metal will not burn, but when you have a crumb of, of chametz and you put the fire on it, it will start burning. And you're like, okay, here I burned, here another one, here another one. And of course the fridge. So the fridge, you know, it's chametz. The cabinets, I mean the cabinets also, you want to take everything out. It has to be thorough cleaning, but you can come now with magnifying glass and, you know, 5,000 watt lamps to see if there's a little bit of a... You know, sometimes I peep, see people like, oh my gosh, like, this is not, it's not, not normal. And again, like I told you, use a strong chemical, it will kill anything and make it not edible, and that's why it's not, and then it, therefore it's not chametz anymore. So again, you have to find a very normal, normal, like a healthy a point where you're not crossing it to become not normal. And... Uh, and it's good to be in Pesach cleaning OCD, but not in the places that are not required. Bathroom, storage room, uh, the laundry room, the chandeliers, the 12 foot closets that there's no chametz up there. Uh, but needless to say, yeah, you want to make a thorough cleaning. You still have to buy shampoo and soap and yeah. all your... Uh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, because uh, there are also there's chametz in there. Yeah, in the deodorant, in the shampoo, in the... My dog, I don't have a dog, but don't eat it. Yeah, but you can't own it. Even if you have chametz, you can't own any chametz. <coughs> now, another important thing that you need to know is, the, is your table and your countertops. Because the table also has chametz on it. Now, to clean such of a table, doesn't have to be a four-hour thing. You just, again, spray on it a good chemical, and you wipe it very well. It will kill anything that is edible, and then just cover it. You can cover it with a tablecloth that will be permanent, or with a thin paperboard. And, and now in Pesach, almost all the stores, they sell you all these things that you very easily can... Uh, so easy. Yeah, and you just want to cover it, that it's not going to be touching. And the same thing with the counters. Counters are a little bit harder. Again, you don't want to go completely cuckoo with the counters. The easiest way is to take uh, your kettle, you boil the kettle, you want to do it probably like 10 times, but you pour boiling hot water on the counters, backwards and forth, let it cool down, wash it down, you'll make a little bit of a mess in the kitchen, another round, and just boiling hot water on the counters. Take a toothpick in the corners where it's you know, meeting the corners and where it's connected to the, 
to the sink or whatever, just to go around, or like you said, a toothbrush, you know, scrub it real well. Do it three, four times with boiling hot water. Again, it will get all the dirt out. Then you just cover the counters with the, the I, how I do it is I will cover everything with foil and I would leave some water on the counters so when I put the, the foil, it's kind of like vacuum sticks to it. And today you can buy this very uh, thick foil. After I cover everything with foil very well, and then I put on it these uh, like little plastic boards because if you're gonna start cutting things on that counter, there's a chance you will rip the foil. So you will put these little counting, uh, counter boards. They're usually made out of plastic or very thin, uh, uh, not fiberglass, I remember, I don't remember the name of the material. And that's it, and everything is covered. And again, you don't have to go completely cuckoo. Sometimes you see people that they, you know, they're, uh, they see these pictures going on on the social media where everything is wrapped around with foil and the, and the chairs and the, and the handles and, and then and the kid is wrapped with foil and like, mommy, you wrapped me by mistake. And <laughs> so, needless to say, you want to do a very good and thorough cleaning, but not to lose your mind here. And of course, uh, <coughs> uh, anything that's in the kitchen, so you have chairs, and you have uh, the table that you sit in, and uh, you want to clean everything, and the chairs too. That's uh, why I, I, some people I know, chairs are easy. You know, these chairs are like 30 shekels, a chair. So you, if you have the ability, you buy four chairs and you use them for Pesach. But nevertheless, uh, sometimes that's the easy way out, just to buy everything for Pesach, and if not, then just make sure that you're cleaning it very well. We have such a sale at Super South, four beautiful folding chairs, 120 yeah. The point, the problem is not with the buying, is where you store it. That, that's the problem. I mean, the buying is one thing. If you can afford, that's great. But then where do you store it? So, not everybody has room. I mean, uh, we lived once in a house that was very, very small. I didn't have where to store things. So here we have a nice size storage, so it's easy to throw everything in. <clears throat> and one last thing that is very important, some of you do have, is uh, the kids' high chairs. That's where it has like a hummus strap because the kids, they make a whole mess on the high chair. And not only that, then the, the, this, the high chair is, you know, all these cracks and the, where everything is connected. That you have to be very, very thorough how you're cleaning it because sometimes the kids, that's just to keep the kid quiet and he has a cookie here and a piece of another cookie here and, mm -hmm. and they suck on it all and then it starts becoming liquid and it starts getting uh, stuck everywhere and the high chairs are usually like a, a literally a hummus strap. So high chairs and the car seats. So again, if you can get a replacement for the hug, great. If not, this is where you want to be, not OCD, but really thoroughly cleaning it because that's where the chametz gets trapped. <clears throat> and the most important thing to remember, again, that dirt is not chametz, and food that is not edible, that is completely destroyed by a chemical, is not chametz, and one should not go crazy. Better to do your emotional, mental, and spiritual cleaning and than uh, scrubbing walls. So, but nevertheless, the house has to be clean. You can't have any chametz. You can't see any chametz. You can't own any chametz. You want to make sure that the cleaning is good. A good week of cleaning, if the house is not so big, is fine. And uh, needless to say, if you can get a blowtorch, I don't know if they're so easy to get here. In America, you get them in uh, Home Depot. Here in Israel, I think because of safety, and uh, it's not so easy to get them. Uh, yesterday, I went to one of the stores where they sell these big balloons gas balloons, and uh, it's very hard to get, uh, get them in Israel. Not hard, but they're not off the shelf in any convenience store. But if you can get a blowtorch, and with the blowtorch go on certain things, knowing you're not gonna melt the house, or put the house on fire, then it's uh, good to do, and needless to say, you wanna know what you're doing here. But the most important thing is that you wanna bring the house to a clean state, and not to go crazy and not to now lose sleep and start uh, polishing every button and every uh, corner of the house. That's really not healthy and you're not cleaning any chametz here. And of course, once you did a very thorough cleaning, you want to take into consideration that when you're doing the biur chametz in the, the yiratzon that we say, then you're saying there, if I missed any, whatever I missed or whatever I don't know of, 
then it should be cancelled like, uh, like the er ash, ashes and the sand of the earth. And the main, is, main part is to get rid of the inner chametz. The whole point here, the whole ceremony and the whole ritual is to bring me to a point that I will get rid of my own, my own chametz, my own ego, my own midot that are bad, all the things that are uh, uh, evil and bad and rotten in me. And that's, we started talking about it in the class on Sunday. Today we're going to have the second part after, not a, a third class, not this one. But that's the main part. Pesach is for me to really clean myself. To bring myself to a place that I'm humble, that I'm able to see where I am wrong. And to be able to refine myself. Pesach is a, a, a holiday of refinement, of cleaning. So, Bezrat Hashem should uh, have a very easy process in their cleaning. Should be meaningful. So, just remember, you have to clean, clean the house well but not to become a slave. Our point is to be going out of slavery, not into slavery.